and we are live. How are we all? Alright, tonight's topic. Now this is on the, uh, this is on the fact of a uh, news article that's come out in news here in Australia today, um, that basically I have been harping on about for that long Funnily enough, I've been proven right again. Telstra is atrocious. And we'll talk about that tonight. But as you can tell, nothing out again today. And this is going to be a real rant. <sighs> Sorry, the glasses are filthy. On bad telcos. And sheer lack of decency tonight here um, emanating from what happened with me today which was dead set in the fair income department and utter disgrace but first Telstra one of the worst telco companies here in Australia it controls the entire access out of this country. They own the lot. And they've been smashed about the face by the ACCC, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Over around 42,000 customers who are paying for NBN and not getting the speed they're paying for. Now, the old adage, if you get what you pay for, definitely doesn't equate with these 42,000-odd uh, consumers. G'day, WWE. How are you, mate? Now, the ACCC here in Australia is a little bit of a toothless tiger. A little bit of a toothless tiger. They say a lot, and not, not a lot ever happens after they've said it. But today, they've actually taken Telstra to task. 42-odd thousand Telstra customers are paying through the nose for apparent speeds that they're not even getting. Such as one customer, not one, sorry, about two or three customers are paying for speeds above 50 megabit. They're getting five. Now... Not too bad, WWE. How are you, mate? Telstra. Most Australians migrate to them because that's all they know because of they're either my age or older, right? And back then, it was just telecom. So they figure, look, nothing's changed. It's just traditional old school telecom Australia. Well, we... Anyone who's been around IT and Telco for that long will tell you, Telecom Australia and Telstra are, you know, I'm off the screen here with my hands. G'day, Jim. How are you? So the ACCC takes Telstra to task over these shocking billing for no service deals. Now, okay, Telstra's been fined. Bit of a drop in the ocean with Telstra and has been forced by the toothless tiger of the ACCC to arrange with these 42,000 customers some sort of alternative plan. One of the alternatives is to release the consumer from the contract. Telstra's not going to do that. Anyone who has tried to work with Telstra knows that getting out of a Telstra contract, even if Telstra says you can get out of the contract, they make it very, 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 how many more times can I say very, difficult. In fact, it's nigh on impossible. Now, the ACCC is a bit of a toothless tiger here in Australia, but the public's been 
bashing their head at the ACCC to take on petrol prices they, never, they won't. We all know there's collusion there. But they've taken Telstra to task over this. Now, with Telstra controlling around 90-something-odd percent of Australia's WAN capacity, meaning other telcos buy bandwidth capacity from Telstra, Telstra is saying that, oh, it's only about a fifth of our customers that are worried, and it's not too bad. It's 42,000 Australians that you've made a fortune off and given them nothing. Jim, I know, I heard about BT. As, as, as WW and I, WWE and I both discovered, BT is about as bad as Telstra here in Australia. This, this is habit with Telstra. I'm assuming Jim's nodding his head going like this. Yes, it's the same with BT. Poor customer service, atrocious billing, Poor service from a from a um, network point of view. Stuff all capacity at high time. Forty two thousand customers now. Telstra have been ordered by the court to essentially, and I say essentially because you can guarantee Telstra is going to do one of two things. They're either going to appeal it. Or they're going to try and work out a way of getting around the ACCC. Now, getting around the ACCC is dead easy. Any ordinary Aussie will tell you it's dead easy to get around the ACCC. And it is. Companies do it daily. The three options. One, release, release the customer from the existing contract, allowing them to go somewhere else, but don't cut the service until the new contract starts. Telstra will cut them off straight away if they leave Telstra. That'll happen. No grace period. They'll just they'll slice the cable, essentially. Number two, arrange with the customer to better suit what they're paying for versus their actual line capacity. So you agree with me, they'll try and eat, what, WWE, will they try and go around the ACCC or will they appeal the ACCC in the federal court? What do you reckon? Seriously. Um, Jim, Telstra doesn't have engineers here in Australia anymore, they're all contractors. Most of the exchanges, um, and I can real, I don't know about WWE, you'd have to ask him about Queensland, here in Victoria... 90% of Telstra people are subbies. Even the people going into the exchanges are subbies. Um, this is just... This is typical Telstra. And to make a parallel with BT over in the UK, they're exactly the same. They work in exactly the same fashion. It's their way or the highway. Now... I can't remember what it's called in the UK, and apologies to anyone watching the UK if I can't remember who controls your, who gives oversight to your telco industry, I've forgotten, my apologies. Here in Australia, we've got the telecommunications ombudsman. Ombudsman, ombuds, lady, I can't remember. Ombuds person, to be politically correct. Ombudsman, because that's what I'm going to call it. Ombudsman. Okay. They get more calls in sheer frustration, annoyance, iration over Telstra than any other telco here in Australia. Okay, WW, I'll put it this way to you. The ACCC, you and I being an Aussie, we know that it's a fairly toothless tiger. How many years has the public been bashing its head at the ACCC about fuel prices? Now, if they don't go the federal court route and appeal the decision, what will they do with the ACCC? 
Oh, this is just typical of telcos. Now, Jim, out of the UK, BT. For a long time, BT had a reputation globally as being one of the best telco providers globally. What the hell happened to BT? The research I've now done on BT versus what most Aussies know about Telstra suggests, well, either BT's become Telstra or Telstra's become BT. Take your pick. But to give Jim and my UK viewers an idea, BT is pretty much on par with Telstra here in Australia. Now, Telstra basically is a shortened version of Tele Telecom Australia, Telecommunications Australia, which became Telecom Australia, which became Telstra. Huh. Ofcom in the UK. Thank you, Jim. Like I said, apologies. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I completely forgot what it's... Um, Jim, Ofcom. Office of Telecommunications... Something. Isn't it? I can't, I can't remember. Um, Office of Telecommunications... Jim, help. <laughs> I'm pleading with you, mate. I don't want to look like a fool. Yes, they do. New Zealand has far better internet than us, WWE. Christ, Africa does. The States do. Japan does. South Korea does. Honkers does. Singapore does. The stupid thing is that Singtel, which is a Singapore, Singapore government-owned Telecommunications company owns Optus. Work that one out. Um, uh, G'day, Serge. Yes, I will, mate. I'll be there. All oh, right. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, so, now, so I've, I've spoken about the stuff up with Telstra. Let's heap more wood on that fire. And this is just a sheer lack of stinking decency with service providers here in Australia. Now, I can't talk about New South Wales. I can't talk about Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, Northern Territory, Tassie. I'm looking at this purely from a Victorian point of view here in regional Victoria. Okay. I get a phone call from another tech I know in an absolute panic. I mean a panic. A customer of his who is in his probably late 70s, early 80s, wheelchair bound. This guy has been in a wheelchair for 30 something years. He's living in a caravan park. To my US viewers, trailer park. I don't know what my British or European viewers call it. But he lives up this caravan park. All right, WWE understands what I'm talking about as well. And, like I said, we're going to throw more, more wood on the fire, especially the fire that Telstra's just created. So here's this late 70s, early 80s gentleman and um, another friend of mine who's a text on the phone to me in a right panic. Six weeks ago, he had to have a new phone line run to his place of residence. The first Telstra tech couldn't get a signal out to the Sputnik. Couldn't get a signal. In the caravan park, there's a Sputnik what's called a Sputnik here in Australia. It's, it's just a great big bollard that all the phone lines come into. The technical term is Sputnik. I 
Oh, cheers, Jim. Thanks, mate. So this is six weeks. Couldn't get a line. The poor guy's in a damn wheelchair, okay? He's got a mobile phone. Where he is at the moment, and I'm not going to say where he is, there's very little 4G signal. There's very little 3G signal. He's lucky if he can get two. He's wheelchair bound. How the hell? He's got to ring a person further down his row to go up to the supermarket with his phone to recharge it. Couldn't get a phone line. Three weeks later, another text shows up. Drops an NBN cable. Coax cable to the property. Caravan park hit the roof, no cable. Two weeks ago, another Telstra tech shows up, lays a proper RJ11 lead. I get called in by this other tech that I know in a right panic. I get down there. And this just shows you the lack of decency in this whole equation. They plug the wall up. They plugged up the RJ11 lead, plugged it up, told him it was fine, everything works. You want the kicker? They didn't plug in his home phone, they didn't plug in his modem, and they didn't plug in his fax machine. They left it just sitting there. The guy, and I quote, it's fine, mate, it's all working, I'll let you guys see you later. This bloke is in his late 70s, he's in a goddamn wheelchair, and this tech can't even have the decency to plug this poor guy's phone, fax, and modem into the wall plug. Didn't even leave him with the correct phone plug in the wall or a splitter. He's put an RJ45 plug into the wall. This poor old guy's only got RJ11 plugs, so he didn't even give him a converter. happened to decency in the telco industry? Well, it's just gone out the bloody window now. This is just a case of, oh, the guy is in a wheelchair, it's not my responsibility, I'm just going to leave him. You can't do that. Clearly, I am old school. I went down there. This poor guy, he's in an absolute state of telco disarray. Nothing's working. He's as arthritic as hell. I mean, the poor guy's hands are like this and about 50 times thicker than my fingers, right? He's got, an, he's got a, 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 a tablet-y thing, but he's barely able to use it. He needs his computer. This dickhead tech put an RJ45 plug, phone plug into the wall when all his equipment is, funnily enough, RJ11, problem number one. Problem number two, he's gone, yep, phone works, mate, I'll leave you alone. He didn't even plug anything up for the poor guy. My mate's down there trying to get his net, his, his computer sorted out. I've had to go and sort out the telco stuff. What's happened to decency these days? Why are people just doing dump and runs now? You can get your cash, walk it. You're talking about a guy who's in a damn wheelchair. You can't even have the common decency to connect his stuff up. <sighs> G'day, Liberty. G'day, Serge. How are you, mate? Oh, that's just... Is there no such thing as common decency now? Is there no such thing as, you know, going in, spending an extra couple of seconds to make sure his equipment actually works? I'm only 37. Decency has to be out there still somewhere, surely to God, or am I just getting too old? Now, according to this poor old guy, 
the three texts that went in there, and he's a good judge of age, this bloke, reckons they were all under 25. I don't know what's going on with 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 the uh, with the services industry these days. I don't know. I okay. <laughs> okay, if it was me, okay, I understand what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing with telco and IT. Fine. You're talking about a late seventies, early eighties old bloke, wheelchair bound, arthritic as all get out. He doesn't drive anywhere. He's got to get maxi-taxis. Now, for my international viewers, they are like uh, people movers that you can roll a wheelchair straight into the back of. The guy's wheelchair bound. These three techs firstly BS'd him completely, and the last one didn't even have the decency to plug it up. He plugged his test phone into the wall to check that it worked, left him high and dry. Righto, Jim. That's just disgusting. I, I must be getting old. I must. I just must be old school because clearly new school is just dump and run. No decency. Nothing. Just, just get it in there. Get out. How, how do you do that to someone that old? How the hell do you treat someone like that that old in the service industry? He just needed a new phone line. The first tech couldn't even get a phone line to the Sputnik, for God's sake. He spent an hour there and couldn't get a port. How? How the hell you muck that up? Obviously, it'd be my age then, Woody, WWE. He's clearly not a new age tech then. Is that what you're saying? He'd be, you know, around my age, mid-30s. Because the three techs that went out to this poor old guy were less than 25 years old. You know, you just... I know times are changing. I know people are time poor. 30 seconds. 30 seconds is all he had to do, at least plug the poor old guy's phone in. He's been spending a fortune on recharge cards. At least plug his home phone in for him. And then my, my other mate could go down and set up his new computer and his printer and his fax. No, didn't plug nothing in. Just said, plug the test phone in, which actually, funnily enough, looks like an old school phone, right? Plug the test phone in. Said, yeah, it's working, mate. I'll see you later. Yeah, okay. So he's old school like me, WWE. It's the older ones that do the decent thing. It must be these young people. They don't want to do the decent thing. They just dump and run. Um, that's what I do. Oh, you've got to have a bit of decency. And this... this, this this all came about all in one hit because I found out about the Telstra thing. I found out about this poor old guy. Now, to give you an idea, my mate who I was helping, because we had to go and get an adapter plug from RJ45 to RJ11, my mate, who was out on the call, stopped the clock. Now, for my international viewers, stopping the clock on a job here in Australia is not that common. My mate did it. The minute I got down there, saw, it, saw what the problem was, we brainstormed a way of getting around it, he stopped the clock while I disappeared for 50 minutes, right? I had to go into Geelong, come back out. That's a 50-minute round trip. 
to get a, a um, an RJ45 to RJ11 converter and a new filter. My mate stopped the clock for this old guy. Now, that's a decent thing to do. That's decency. You stop the clock. See, I, the guy's on a damn pension. Okay? It's just... Liberty. I had a call from our vendor once. He was on site and couldn't figure out how to trace a port that needed activating to the switch in the telecom closet. I'm actually pissed off because of a lack of decency for an old guy. Liberty, Telstra out here is a disaster. They dump and run. Older guys like WWE said, do the decent thing, plug everything up. This poor old guy had three techs. One stuffed up and went against caravan park rules. That was the first problem. One couldn't get a port to the Sputnik, only to find out that the Sputnik was um, five metres from this poor old guy's caravan. And the third bloke put the wrong plug in the wall. Well, the first two is definitely a lack of competence, granted, Paul. The third one's just a sheer lack of decency, um, which I think is a big problem. The good news, actually, that came out of today, and I did see this as well, um, one of Australia's most favoured Telcos. Now, this one caught me by surprise. One of Australia's more trusted telco providers for both home and mobile is Optus, closely followed by Vodafone, which took me by surprise because Vodafone's coverage from a um, 4G point of view isn't crash hot in certain areas. But Australia's favoured telco provider, funnily enough, that gets, okay, yeah, okay, the Ombudsman still gets hounded from it, but not to the level of Telstra, is Optus. Which sort of confused me, because obviously Optus has to buy capacity from Telstra. Now, for my international viewers, Telstra essentially owns, retrospectively as well, 90% of the infrastructure here in Australia. Probably 95% of the copper line covering the whole country, that includes Tasmania, so mainland Australia and Tasmania, is all owned by Telstra. So for a long time, Optus had to buy capacity from Telstra until they could afford to get their own pits. Um, and then an agreement was made with Telstra that they could actually feed their cables and their, um, oh, what do they call? Someone help me. I can't remember the terminology for coax leads and everything like that through Telstra's pits. And yet they are one of the most liked telcos here in Australia. Now that took me. Now, Optus have always had this, unfortunately, like most Australian businesses, the call centres are overseas. Optus is, unless your business, Telstra, it's all overseas. There's very little of Telstra's done here in Australia. Okay? Um, the only way you can get to talk to Telstra here in Australia is to get to level three. And that's via the Ombudsman. But, Optus is actually one of the preferred telco providers. Some of the smaller ones, double INET, no surprise there. TPG, think of them what you want. Now, TPG is called, oh, was it Total Peripherals Group initially? So you've got that. Um, Vodafone, 
Um, now, I don't know what Vodafone's called this. Well, somewhere it's called Vodacom. And somewhere else it's actually Vodafone F-O-N-E. I can't remember where it's Vodacom and Vodafone, but Vodatelco, basically. Hello, Colin. How are you, mate? Um, do you see the report on Telstra today, Colin? And does it surprise you? Um... Yes, they are like hen's teeth, Liberty. I fully agree with you. There's not many of them around. Uh, um, yeah, so, okay, Liberty, question for you. Virgin, over there, do they have their own D-slams or do they have to buy it directly off BT's D-slams? Or have you got telcos that can put D-slam racks into BT exchanges. Colin, the ACCC, now Colin's just fallen off his chair here, has finally done something. Now Colin's on the ground, surprised and shocked. I'm not kidding you, Colin. The ACCC has done something about Telstra. Yes, I have WWE. I have heard about them. I don't know who their backhaul is. I presume it's either Optus or TPG. Um, Colin's absolutely mortified at the moment. The ACCC's done something about Telstra. <laughs> okay, Liberty. Are Virgin allowed into BT's exchanges? around the country, you know, London, Manchester, Liverpool, everywhere. Wherever there's a BT central exchange, can Virgin put their own rack equipment in that exchange or do they have to build their own exchanges and the wiring get routed between the two? Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for Colin to get back to me because I think he's completely fallen off his chair. Okay, well, that differs with us with a bit here, Liberty. Um, the government actually forced Telstra's hand to say that Optus, which is our second biggest telco here in Australia, and TPG must be allowed in the larger exchanges to put their own equipment in. Telstra fought it. WWE sitting there going, I'm not surprised Telstra fought it because Telstra will fight everything to block anyone doing anything. And Liberty, in most major exchanges, except obviously where I am, <laughs> um, but in most major central exchanges and capital city exchanges, other telcos have got their own rack equipment in what was Telstra facilities. I'm going to tell... Yeah, it is, Colin. Now, I ask this at WWE. I'm going to ask this to you. Will Telstra go and appeal at the federal court or will they try and get around the ACCC? What do you reckon? WWE reckons they'll work out a way of weaseling out of it. Do you reckon they'll appeal it at the federal court? Or do you, do you reckon Telstra will do their standard thing and try and work their way around the ACCC regs, regulations? <clears throat> Liberty's going for coffee. I have two of those every morning, Paul. I have one before I make the daily promo and I have one during the daily promo here. And that's the funny thing. My two coffees are only... Um, I finish one coffee, boot the e-server up, come down with a second cup of coffee. Seven minutes later. Pretty quick. Exactly. You're exactly right, Colin. The funny thing is, with the report I read, they've got three options. One... 
to release the, those customers from their contracts. Now, you and I both know Telstra's not going to do that without putting up a fight, are they? They're not going to let a customer walk away. Number two is to give them a more realistic price against their current speed. Three is to change their plan or change capacity line structure. Which of those three do you reckon Telstra will actually do? Now, one of them, you and I both know, so does WWE, Telstra's going to put up a fight about saying for people to relieve them from their existing contracts. Because Telstra doesn't do that. Um, you know, it's just a sheer stuffer. I mean, Telstra are useless. Now, admittedly, and I guess I'm a little bit lucky in this, my ISP does not buy capacity from Telstra. My ISP buys capacity from a wholesaler, which is backed off the Optus T1 agreement. And so they got a, t I think it's a T1, top tier agreement, right, for back all capacity. Um, that, sorry, you're right. I, uh, I forgot about the fourth one. Yes, Colin, I did. Colin, I put it to you this way. If Telstra go down the route of allowing people to leave their existing contracts, what do you reckon the minute they say I'm leaving, their phone and internet will get cut straight away? What are the chances? What, even money bet? An unbackable favourite? DJ, yes. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Um, DJ FX tonight, we're heaping it on Telstra. And uh, I, I'm just giggling at what I saw in the news, what was released by that, you know, that Toothless Tiger, the ACCC DJ FX? You heard of that? The Toothless Tiger up there in Sydney took Telstra to task. I would probably say with Telstra what they'll do, I and mean, there's no way they'll let customers go. Because that'd be a um, that'd be a knock-on effect very quickly. So Telstra's not going to let that one happen. They've been told they have to do it. But telling a telco to actually do something and a telco actually doing something are uh, 100 miles apart, 160 kilometres apart. They don't do it. They work out a way of getting around it. It's, it, it's common knowledge. Um, will you guys stop talking about coffee? That's harsh. <laughs> I have a coffee now. And dead said, I'm still going to be awake tomorrow morning for the Thursday promo. I'm not kidding you. I like a Rubica coffee, personally. Can I join your club in that column? Is that, is that all right if this little Victorian joins your club? I'm sure WWE up in FNQ would like to do the same thing. Can, can we both join your club? <laughs> um, Serge, stop it. <laughs> I don't want... You guys talking about coffee is making me want a coffee. And yes, I agree with you, Serge. Jamaican coffee is nice coffee. I had it before. So actually... To be brutally honest, while we're just quickly off topic on coffee, um, Turkish coffee I love, Italian coffee and Greek coffee, as well as Arabica coffee and Jamaican coffee. They're my three favourite. Um, uh, 
Colin will be sitting there going, yes, more people joining the Telstra club. I, every time I've had to deal with a business on Telstra, it was back when I was working in the industry full time, every time I've had to go through a, 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 a Telstra tech at a business grade level, you've got, I've got to remind them that they're not talking to an idiot. They're not talking to, to, to an employee. They're talking to someone that knows, knows the industry. Right? So you talk to them, and they sit there and say, oh, have you tried the motor? Oh, you know, this, my standard comment now to any ISP, whether it be for myself, a friend of mine, or a business, the first thing I've got to say to them is, before we start on this, and I quote myself, you are talking to a fully qualified IT technician who's been dealing in IT and telco for X years. So don't treat me like someone who doesn't understand the system. You're talking to a fully trained tech. And all of a sudden they sit there and go, oh, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, mate, so we're going to bump you up to level two. It's the first thing I've got to say. I'm not the only tech that has to say it. My mate, my good friend at his computer business, has to do the same thing every time. With every ISP here in Australia, it's ridiculous. Um, ah, WWE. Hang on. Hang on, hang on. The ruling today says that Telstra can't charge a cancellation fee. Right? They're not allowed to. Because of these 42,000 odd people, right, Telstra can't charge that cancellation fee. They have to let them go. Okay? But what's the bet if they say, I want to leave? Phone's gone like that. There'll be no grace period while they look for another service. They'll just get cut. Now, WWE. Even money bet, better than even money, or pretty much 100% lock, stock, and barrel guaranteed. That'll be what Telstra does. Um, you know, it's just... <laughs> oh, Colin, that is brilliant. You don't need coffee when you're with Telstra because they keep you on your toes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is that is in the fair income dead set department, 100% true. 100% true. Um, Good point, DJ. Good point, mate. Tell, and, and it's not just the current government, it's both governments. It doesn't matter whether it's the coalition or the Labor. Telstra will always lobby them. Um, and and, and that's, that's exactly right. Um, you know... The old British comedy, going oh, way back in time now. Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. It's one of my favourite British comedies. Still is today. And I still hold this true. What was shown back then is pretty much the way it still is today. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. But... You know, I think, I think something's got to be done. I mean, you can't have, you can't have the, the, these Telstra, I mean, the problem, the other problem with Telstra is now is about, I mean, it's about 60 or 70% of the workforce now is all sub, it's all subcontracted. Same with our pay TV provider. It's all subcontract work. 
Telstra have very few employed techs, right? They're all subs. It just seems like some of these younger subs don't know CSR very well. The guy that set my NBN up here, okay, um, now, I, I, as I've said, I've got FTTN at the moment, fiber to the node, and then XDSL from the node to here, okay? My NBN, okay, yeah, Telstra did cut me off the minute I stopped the contract with them. The phone was cut off as soon as I hung the phone up, okay? Um, the actual NBN setup took, oh, well, when the guy actually arrived, it was about seven minutes from when he walked in the door to when I turned the modem on and had line sync. Seven minutes. Now, that's quick. You get a Telstra tech to do it. I know this because I've had it happen to me. Take them an hour. A young sub Telstra tech, and I've had them before, it's an hour. It's competent. Like Liberty Paul said earlier, it's competence. They're not exactly competent all the time either. Like WWE said, the guy that went in and set his up showed decency. He stayed there to make sure that everything that, that he had works. The guy that came here from my ISP walked in the door, had a look, put the tester on the line, went down to the Sputnik, put the converter on, came back in here, took it off, told me to turn the modem on, waited for the modem to actually pick up WAN sync, not internet, just WAN sync. Said, well, now you've got to ring the ISP to get your logon details. Done. Now that's decent. That's a decent thing to do. This poor 70-year-old is just... He, I feel sorry for him being treated like that. That's just a disgrace. It's a disgrace to treat anyone like that, but especially someone in a wheelchair. And like I said, the poor guy's arthritic. You know, that's, a, that, that's his hands open. It's not fair. <laughs> yeah, Mur yeah, Murdoch's Foxtel, exactly. Um, G'day, Shader. How are you, mate? We're talking about bad telcos tonight. Decided to pick a topic. Let's vent about some of the worst telcos around the world. <laughs> um, you know, I just think it's disgusting. Utterly disgusting that, you know, you, you, you have these, these companies around the world, and as Liberty said, it's the same with with Liberty, you know, BT is shocking, absolutely shocking, and you find this all the time with these, these um, telcos that own the whole of the infrastructure for going away. I look if you've ever. If, if you want to see what happens when a telco gets busted up, go and have a look at a documentary here on YouTube the day after AT&T America got split up. It was a disaster because they lost control of what Bell La uh, Western Electric had laid. If you want to see how a telco reacts when they are forced to break themselves up, go and watch the AT&T doco, it's on YouTube, right, the day after the ruling. Yeah, WWE, common. Dead common. I had the same problem where I was living um, in another part of the Geelong area years ago. 
I was only by driving distance 1.1 kilometres from the exchange. I was 1.8 kilometres cable distance. There was 150 metres of cable just wound up in the pit, covered with electrical tape. As soon as it damn well rains, what happens to your internet? Um, oh, they, look, Shader, you're right. But any government-owned telco is a disgrace. But like I said, if you want to see what happens when a big telco is forced into busting itself up, go and find the documentary on AT&T the day after the ruling. They weren't happy. They didn't like it. They tried to fight it and they couldn't. Exactly. Exactly, WWE. Nailed it on the head, mate. Right on. Dead set in the fair income department. Actually, I'll, do, I'll tell you what. WWE is a Queenslander. He'll know this. WWE. Nine's Wide World of Sports. Ray Warren. You ready? In the fair income dead set department, he's absolutely nailed it. I don't think that's too bad a Ray Warren impersonation. What do you reckon, WWE? Don't worry, my international viewers won't have an idea of what I just said then. Um, but, I mean, Shader's right, WWE's right, Colin's right. What do you do with these companies? Like how, how do you get them to, uh, uh, other than a full customer revolt, which doesn't always work, the only problem with Telstra here is it's not government owned. It's on the stock market. It's public. What do we got, WWE? Is it Telstra 1, 2, 3 or Telstra... Telstra 1, Telstra... No, there's three... There's three... Listings for Telstra on the ASX, isn't there? Well, Colin, can you remember? I can't remember. What is that? There's Telstra 1, which is the initial release. Telstra 2, which is the second release. Is it Telstra 3? Yeah. <laughs> um... You know, see, this is the other thing. It also comes back to the old retail adage, which also seems to have got thrown out the window these days, or is it just I'm getting old? But who remembers the customer was always right? No, that's just me. I must just, I'm obviously behind the times because that's clearly not the way things are done these days. Actually, I have to, actually, as an antidote, antidote to that, antidote, anecdote to that, when I first got internet, and uh, it was on, are you ready for this? Now, most Australians will remember this. The rest of the world was well ahead of us in speed. I was on, you ready? You ready? 28.8K dial-up for about two years. Then I went to 56K dial-up. But the ISP I had when I first got the internet, and this is when we were all living as a family back in Melbourne, going... 20 odd years ago now. It would be about that too. Um, it would be about 21, 22 years ago. Um, we had a problem with our ISP. They were a, apparently saying that we were, you know, using the modem for, you know, unsolicited services. What they didn't realise was that I was keeping a log of every time we dialed. And I informed them and they said, oh, we do apologise, we were wrong. Now, how often do you see that from a telco these days, whether it's public or private or government? Um, <laughs>
Howard Howard privatised Telstra One, and then I think Rudd did T Two. No, hang on. Keating floated the idea of T One. Howard launched T1. And then I can't remember whether Howard did T1 and T2 or if Rudd did T2. But Keating initially floated the idea of spinning Telstra off on the ASX. Um... Colin, you're right. You are right. Um, hey, Serge, I saw that too. Anarchy based on Arch. I saw that today. I saw a little write-up about that today while I was doing a whole pile of other stuff. Um, what's it actually like? <laughs> giggle, Serge. I giggle at that. Um, no, but WWE, they used to, didn't they? They used to. Serge, how heavy is it? As in, like, I'm... I'm I, mean, I haven't got time to have a look at it at the moment because of obviously the Unix stuff I'm about to begin here. But compared to other archers that I've looked at both here on the channel and just for my own interest, how heavy is it? AKA RAM swap, uh, core usage and thread running at dead idle. Like is it as light as a normal Arch Linux or is it one way or the other? Say in comparison to Manjaro, Manharo, whichever way you want to call it. Okay, better yet, Serge, is it at the same level as Manjaro, Manharo? Is it lighter or is it heavier? Um, Would it be worth giving Anarchy the backyard IT treatment, gun having a sticky beak? Um, I'll tell you what I am waiting for, everyone, and I happen to catch uh, English Bob's stream today. I'm waiting for the next Ubuntu. I've already told him I'm going to give him the backyard IT treatment and have a sticky beak at it. I'll give it the back... What, DJ, you reckon we give it the back... You know, the good old uh, Melbourneian backyard IT treatment and have a sticky beak at it? DJ's going, yeah, that'd be about right. <laughs> um, so what, XFCE or LXDE, lightweight X11? Is there much different in... in Idle run between the two, DJ, or not? All right, well, Colin said yes. All right, I'll, well, we've got a few Linux reviews coming up. Not this week, though. I have to get this Unix problem sorted out. And speaking of Unix problems, 
If anyone can tell me how I've managed to stuff up Samba, I've put the video up today. If anyone can tell me how I've managed to completely botch up Samba, can you have a look and tell me what I did wrong? Because I, this has never happened to me before. I've obviously done something in a frustrated mood. I have to get the Unix project done. Now, I now know what I did wrong with OpenBSD 6.2. I actually sat down calmly and went through what I did wrong, so I know what I've done wrong now, which is good. All right, DJ. All right, Serge, I'll have a look at <laughs> DJ. Wait, well, yeah. well, give it the good old Melbourne and sticky beat, DJ, eh? <laughs> My international viewers have got no idea what that means, but DJ does. <laughs> He's, he knows exactly what I mean. Um, oh, look, I'm willing to have a look at it. Not this week, um, but I am willing to have a look at it. I mean, I've had a look at Arch here before. I ha I, I, you guys know that. I've had a look at Manharo Linux. Um, Well, exactly, Colin, but the worst thing about Samba at the moment is I don't know what I botched. Sorry, I should use an Australian terminology. Hang on, Colin. Um, okay, Colin, I don't know what I mucked up. I don't know what I mucked up. So if anyone can go and have a look at that video I did today on Samba um, and tell me what I mucked up, uh, it'd be good to know because I, I've, I don't know what I've done wrong. I I honestly don't know what I did wrong. And also the fact that the hard drive space is not reading right either. You'll see that in that same video. So I've mucked something up in Samba. Now, if necessary, I'll delete Samba and start again. I'll just rm Samba-4.5.8 and redo it all over again if I have to. I don't want to, but if that's the only way I'm going to fix the issue, I will. Unmount the drive, delete the drive, and then redo it. But I've done something wrong, and I don't know what. Um, no, Serge, um, on the e-server, right, OpenBSD61, it's running a standalone only. Um, reason being is because I run OpenBSD as a network infrastructure server, um, I'm not using it as a PDC. So I don't have Kerbos or anything. It's just a standalone Samba share with a 300 gig U320 drive coming off a of storage tech D240 on a um, SCSI U320 LVDSE interface. Um, I do have a vid view of video request about setting up Samba as a PDC, but I'm not going to use the e-server for it. It'll be a separate video completely for that one. The other bit of news, um, got a problem. Now, we all know that I use OBS here. In fact, a lot of people use OBS everywhere, but I've got a bit of a problem. Don't know how I'm going to do it on Solaris without putting a Linux emulator into a Unix box, which I'm willing to try, but natively putting OBS into Solaris with FFmpeg is a nightmare. Um, the other option is I just use SSR. So I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I'll work something out so that we can do the videos on Unix separately to what I do here at the desk. But I tried to put OBS into Solaris 
and it was computer says no. I tried to put FFmpeg into Solaris 11.3, computer says no. So I'm going to try another tact so that I can put OBS onto the Solaris workstation. Um, but I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. I'll work something out, but I don't know because I couldn't get I couldn't get FFmpeg to compile correctly for Unix, and I don't know why. Maybe it can't do it, which would mean I'd have to go to SSR. I'll work something out though. Um, yes, Serge, I do. In fact, Serge, to give you an idea, I'm running. I suppose I should explain to you, Serge, how OpenBSD is actually set up. My OpenBSD box actually runs dual NICs. And I use PF to do NAT in OpenBSD 61. CAS0 is straight into my Endian firewall. NIC2 or CA, sorry, yes, CAS1 runs DACP for my network. Here, my private LAN. Right? So, I actually run three network topologies here at home. I, I, I'm running two, I will be running three with the, with the other added Unix network. Samba on OpenBSD is just file share. Nothing else. It's a standalone workgroup file sharer. Right? No Realm, no NetBIOS, nothing. Right? So, I've got CAS0 plugged into the Endian firewall. CAS1 runs the actual LAN. So, my entire network for here at the desk runs off OpenBSD. The Samba share in it is for systems connected to OpenBSD. There is no PDC log on here and there's no Kerbos 4 or 5 authentication running. It's simply just a standalone Samba share. Nothing else. Coming off SD1, or sorry, I stand corrected, RSD1C a 300 gigs drive. Yes. Well, hang on. Hang on, Serge. Are you saying off CAS0 or CAS1? Liberty. I'd stop gaming before I stop using Linux. Actually, that's not the first time I've heard anyone actually say that. Liberty Paul, that's the first time I've heard. I've heard. Oh, it's, sorry, scratch that. Rewind reality. Take two. Liberty Paul, that's not the first time I've heard someone say that. Um. I, the other thing I was doing today, which I didn't actually bother doing a video on, was actually, I actually haven't used Windows that much today. I've been sitting on, what was I, I was actually sitting on Open Man Driver most of today. Shouldn't need to, Surge, because it's only listening on 192.168.11, which is CAS1 for the local network. Why would I need IPv4? in the firewall when the Samba's sitting on the internal side of the firewall. If Samba's sitting in on the internal side of the firewall on the LAN side rather than the WAN side, I don't need IPv4 sitting in pf.conf because pf.conf is only working NAT translation between CAS1 and CAS0.
How many hours a day were you gaming, Shader? See, Serge, two weeks ago before I broke OpenBSD, I never had to have IPv4 enabled on the LAN behind PF because Samba sits behind PF. It doesn't get out the other side of PF Firewall. PF Firewall is only doing that translation from CAS1 to CAS0. But I didn't have it poured forwarded last time, Serge, and it worked perfectly. So if I, Serge, if I type um, slash etc slash rc dot d slash samba restart, I get um, e4900 svr smbd daemon started ready to connect. Right? This only occurs in file transfer. This does not occur if I'm pulling a file that's already on the shared drive. This only occurs when I actually go from the Mac or the main PC out to the D240. Okay, Serge, if that's the case, what have I got to do? Put a rule into pf.conf going... Um, uh, what is it? Um, now he's got me thinking. Hang on, Serge. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, ETC, where's my pf.conf? There it is. So, Serge, do I have to put into pf.conf on OpenBSD Unix um, match all... Uh, no, sorry. It would be set smbd ip4 ip Would that be what I've got to put into pf.conf? Well, where's that go then, Serge, in OpenBSD? What, uh, what path.conf or into smb.etc? Or does it actually go into unbound.conf? Because I've got, in SMB, smb.conf, I've got IPv4 only matched to, you know, hosts allowed, 192.168.1 and 127. Dot. No, no, Shader, when you're a hardcore gamer, how many hours a day would you gain? Well, we're talking 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, 16. Well, how many hours a day were you gaming? Proc? Hang on. Hang on, Serge. Um, hosts slash etc yeah well that's in that's in Linux Serge I'm running Unix 
The East server doesn't run Linux. The only OS I could put on it was either OpenBSD Unix or Solaris 10. So to convert proc dot or to convert slash proc slash sys slash net slash IPv4 would be in um, would be uh, no not in OpenBSD I don't search not in OpenBSD Um, what would be the the Unix equivalent of proc dot sys? It'd be uh, um, be var, wouldn't it? No, I haven't. I haven't got anything like that in in OpenBSD search because I don't have slash proc slash sys slash net. Shit, Shader, you were you you literally were the blinkers on the screen gaming then, fella. How did you do it? I, you're the only one I know who's been a hardcore gamer. How did you do it? How? 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 Sorry if I seem completely bewildered and shocked by that, but I'm 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 curious, Shader. I, that's all. It's sheer curiosity. How? Okay, so slash proc. Hang on. If you're wondering what I'm doing, everyone, I'm looking for this file that, um... No, Serge, I've got nothing like that in Unix, mate. Nothing. Because Unix doesn't run slash proc slash... What do you say? Yeah, Serge, Unix, or OpenBSD Unix, you don't have slash proc slash sys slash net at all. You don't have that functionality in Unix, especially in OpenBSD. Oh, us. Um, yeah, but you don't play with the rc.com file in uni in OpenBSD. So that's a, that's a no-no. If anything, you got to do um, rc.conf.local. Um, because the, the problem with running rc.conf and playing with the rc.conf is that if you muck up OpenBSD, you haven't got anything to fall back on. Because if you view stuff around with the... Uh, the proper way of doing it is to put it into the rc.conf.local, but I'll have a look um, for it, which would be... Uh, Uh, what am I looking for? Samba, aren't I? Uh, 
Uh, IPv4, isn't it? Uh, I'll have to go into the rc.conf.local. Oh, buggy your windows. Don't give me that crap. Ah, uh, yes, it is, and that's already turned on to a one search. Net.inet.ip.forwarding equals one. That I know for a fact because, uh, yeah, net.inet.ip.forwarding net equals one because it's the only way search, um, because I'm running two NICs. Right, CAS0 out to the gateway, CAS1 running in the local LAN. In order for me to be able to get from, say, here out, I've got to do net.inet.ip.forwarding. That enables NAT translation between CAS1 and CAS0. The problem I've got is that the Samba share is all coming off the one network. It's not NAT translating between two NICs. Everything's sitting behind that. So net.inet.ip.forwarding equals one is activated because if I didn't have that activated, one, I can't, I wouldn't be doing live streams, let alone two, I'd have no internet. Um, yes, I did. Have a look at the video, Serge. Have a look at the video. You'll see what the problem is, mate. Um, I've mucked something up. I haven't had this problem before. I didn't have it before I stuffed it up two weeks ago, and now I've got the problem, and I don't know what I did wrong. I've mucked a setting up inside smb.conf. That's the problem I've got. I've mucked a setting up in that bloody conf file, and I don't know what I've done wrong. So, but I mean, the thing... Um, SMB, uh, not SMB, what's the damn file called? Um, uh, where is it? VAR, isn't it? Samba. Oh, uh, it's not Samba. It's in um, lib, isn't it? USR lib. No, it's not lib, it's um, lib data. No. Lib exec. No, I can't. Oh, local. Sorry. Lib data. All right, Pearl. Can't remember where I put it now. I found it before. Oh yeah. So um, in um, slash user slash local slash lib execs uh, slash samba, the rule is set triple um, seven. I had the ch mod up to triple seven, so the permissions are right. Um, Serge, have a look at the video, mate. I put it up this morning. Um, I'll send you a link to it, Serge. Hang on. Serge, go and have a look at that video link I sent you. You'll see what's going on, Serge. Remembering it is Unix, not Linux, so the uh, the PID is different. 
also the location of the lib data is also different. Well then click on shaders link then search. <laughs> Hang on guys. Oh right. Alright. Um I'm getting the third degree at the moment. Yes, alright, I'll be up in a minute. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the third degree here, boys. Um Oh, okay there. I don't know what my what happened to my link. I don't know why it didn't work. But search, have a look at that and tell me what I did wrong. Because it, it had it it, it it hasn't it's not an error that's come up before until I had to completely redo the network here. So I've done something wrong in smb.conf. But just remember that the PID is different to that of Linux. And so is the location of the logs. Because in Unix, everything is put into um, slash user slash local slash libexec slash samba. Oh, thank you, Shader. I did too. Rookie error. My mistake. <laughs> I'm sick of making mistakes this week. Oh, I suppose... Like I said in this morning's midweek update, I woke up wishing it was Friday. Um, yeah, Paul, the other half is uh, going to give me a bollocking if I don't show up upstairs. All right, guys, got to go. Serge, can you inbox me and let me know or grab my email off the About section of my page and tell me what the hell I've done wrong? Because I thought I... It, it, before I broke OpenBSD two weeks ago, this wasn't a problem. Now it is. I don't know what I've done wrong. So, all right, guys, have a good one. Don't forget, streams tomorrow. And also, I'll put up a video uh, tomorrow explaining this problem with Telstra so that everyone, um, anyone who's in the same boat has got a leg to stand on. Yeah, and then, Serge, you can either inbox me here on YouTube or contact me via email from my YouTube page. Guys, got to go before I get into a world of pain. Because I've got a very nice dinner tonight. I've got roast chicken, chips, and homemade gravy. I ain't missing out on that, believe me. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, guys. We'll catch you around the channel tomorrow. Thank you for all your support, good conversations. We shall catch you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers.